Anyways, I have replaced the axles and the struts. What's next? All right, George, you had us a little stumped at first, so we had to break it down just like you would have to break it down. If you have a noise that only occurs when you're backing up and you're turning the steering wheel, but doesn't occur when you're going forward, you've replaced all these components, what could it be? Well, you've got a front wheel drive vehicle, you've replaced the CV joints, and when they go bad, they click. Your vehicle doesn't have manual transmission because if it did have a manual transmission, we instantly assume it was a synchronizer for reverse. So we've eliminated that process. What could be next? We're thinking possibly this noise is occurring going forward and backwards and you might be eliminating it. Now, what we'd ask you to do is shut off your radio, shut off the fan, so you just have total silence, open the windows all the way and go forward real slowly and listen, then try it a little faster. You can do that in a parking lot or possibly on a side street. The idea is to hear that noise going forward and backward. If you do hear it forward, it's entirely possible it's the power steering pump. Now, if it is the pump, that would mean that it's low on fluid, and that's something you'd want to check. If you've checked that out and it's still a noise, I would then look at the brake system. It could be something as simple as a brake pad that's, that's rubbing up against a rotor. That would be a metal-on-metal -metal contact causing grinding. It could be some hardware that's loose on the brake caliper. That could cause some problems also. Or something as simple as the rotor splash shield rubbing up against the rotor. Now that could also be a problem. So these are little things. Now if you say you've checked that out, I've investigated everything and it's only happening when I'm turning the steering wheel and I'm backing up, that tells me it's possibly something as simple as a plastic inner fender that might have gotten loose. Possibly you picked up a piece of metal or something on the roadway that's rubbing inside and that's causing a grinding sound. So that's why you want you to use all of your senses, shut off all the noises, and figure out what's wrong with it. Hopefully that'll guide you down the right road. We appreciate your question, George. You know, Steve, sometimes all of your senses are required, except for taste, of course. Oh, well, obviously. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, you're not tasting your fluids or what have you, and they alternate, you know, the uh, power steering fluid or whatever. It's toxic, <laughs> but you can tell by that odor. All right. It's never fun to have a noisy car, but it can drive you crazy when you've tried several solutions and can't get it quieted down. It gets pretty frustrating. Robert from Santa Ana, California, left us this question about his screeching situation. I have a 95 Mazda MX-6, and the accessory belt driving the alternator in the water pump makes a horrible, awful, loud screeching noise. Uh, only temporarily I've cured this uh, applying more tension um, and uh, belt dressing. Um, and I've tried four different belts, um, all different brands, and replaced the pulley on the crank and the al alternator in the pump are still running freely and they've not seized up. But um, how it, it's still making this noise. How can I fix this screeching sound? Okay, uh, Robert, it sounds like you've been doing all the right things and you're reasonably frustrated because you've replaced a pulley, you've replaced four different belts uh, from four different manufacturers, and you're still having the problem. Let me uh, give you a couple of possibilities here because this is a little bit elusive. It sounds like, you know, if we were in your place, we'd probably be doing pretty much what you've been doing so far. So let's give you a couple of uh, tips on what might be possibilities. First of all, we talked to Mazda about this, one of the dealerships that we're in touch with, just to compare thoughts. And it turns out that because of the length of that belt and the size of the pulleys and so on that go with it, uh, sometimes the aftermarket manufacturers are absolutely a good match for the factory belt. But they said that the uh, aftermarket belt, sometimes they have a little more of a concern about some screeching noises or slipping. And uh, that may be the situation. But, you know, personally, aftermarket belts I've had good experience with, but that's a possibility. You might, if you haven't tried the dealership, the brand belt that they sell, you might try that. Now, it might be the composition of the rubber or some other idiosyncrasy, but there are some other things that we think might be front and center in your situation. First of all, remember that an alternator under load, you have the brushes internally, the alternator under load can make a screeching noise itself. It's not identical to the sound of a belt, but it's a high-pitched sound. Now, it may be that when you're hearing a screeching noise, it might think it's a belt. It may be that your alternator is doing what it should be doing, or if it's too loud, it's making too much noise, it may have a malfunction when it's under load. What I would suggest you do is either get a stethoscope at a, shop, at a parts store where you can put those stethoscope uh, contacts in your ears, you know, and listen as you go down and listen to the alternator, or one of our DIY tips is to take a large screwdriver, place it on the alternator housing, be very careful careful because the engine will be running when you do this, so be sure it's long enough to not get yourself near the too close to the engine. But you can get a long enough uh, screwdriver 
then put your ear to the screwdriver and you can listen to it and believe it or not the oscillations resonate through the screwdriver to your ear and you can actually hear the sound of the alternator. Now if the screeching is coming from inside the alternator and not the belts then it may be that you were going after the belts this whole time and it was actually inside the alternator where the screeching was coming from. So that's an important tip and it might be that, that uh, very solution that would bring you to the source of your malfunction. Other possibilities include the specifications for the proper tensioning which to do it best you'd need a gauge like this. This is a belt tension gauge. We check the specifications for your vehicle and a couple of specifications you can have. One would be deflection and the other would be the belt tension gauge. So let's go ahead and put this on and show you what you'd be looking for. You put the belt tension gauge on here and what you're looking for, the specifications that we found for your vehicle is that uh, this would have on a new belt, it would be 132 to 176 pounds and a used would be 110 to 150. That's the amount of uh, resistance the belt has to deflection uh, or actually st uh, the stress for the tension on the belt. Now one other visual, even if you don't have this tool, is to check the what we call the deflection. It's a quarter inch on a new belt and a third of an inch on a used belt. So you should double check your tension and be sure that you're looking at the deflection or the tension on the gauge to be sure you're getting it tight enough. That may help you out there. But I'm thinking your alternator may be making noise and you may be thinking it's the belt, Robert. Now, of course, anytime it's a belt, Lauren, it gets kind of embarrassing, if not aggravating, to people around you that you have a squeaking belt all the time. So you want that fixed for several reasons. That's true, because what might start out as a noise could leave you on the side of the road. And whether your question is quiet or loud, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to our website at DIYnet.com, click on the Talk to DIY link, and send us your email. We'll be right back with an automotive solution that'll help you see more clearly on cold winter days. A heater core is a small radiator that transfers heat from your engine into the vehicle's ventilation system. If you believe less is more, you have an experienced Maui Fine Living style. The Fine Living Summer Beach House Giveaway is everything you've ever fantasized about. Aloha! 14 nights at a spectacular beachfront villa, eight round trip tickets, plus a new GMC Envoy XUV. Live the ultimate vacation, the Fine Living Summer Beach House Giveaway, brought to you by GMC. Enter now at fineliving.com. Imagine a foundation that actually works with your skin, not against it. A foundation that covers all your imperfections while giving you the look of beautiful bare skin. Presenting Bare Minerals from Bare Essentials. For 30 years, this innovative beauty company has given you the healthiest makeup on earth. Chemical-free, fragrance-free, all natural products that are actually good for your skin. Liquid and cream foundations contain chemicals, preservatives, and other fillers that can irritate your skin. But Bare Minerals is 100% pure. It covers all your imperfections, yet it feels so weightless on your skin, you'll forget you're even wearing makeup. And Bare Minerals provides a natural physical sunblock that protects your skin against the sun's harmful rays. Bare Minerals Foundation is unlike any other makeup you've ever worn. Like precious pearls, your skin will have a natural luminosity. I will never wear liquid foundation or powder or any of those other makeups. When I first put Bare Minerals on my skin, it was wonderful. It felt, it felt like air. There's nothing that lets people know that you're wearing makeup. Your skin just looks really good. I was so happy with it, so pleased. I felt 10 years younger. Over half of adult women suffer from acne, so no matter what your skin challenges are, Bare Minerals is so pure, there's nothing in it to irritate your skin. It's the perfect foundation for all skin types. You'll receive two foundation tones in each kit, and warmth, a very special Bare Minerals that gives you a look of health and vitality. You'll also receive Mineral Veil, this feather light, airy, and completely sheer powder gives you an unbelievable soft focus finish. Plus three professionally designed brushes. You can try Bare Minerals for 60 days, and if for any reason you're not happy, just send it back for a refund of the purchase price. To order, call 1-800-304-2360. Call now. Next time you're in a jam, talk to DIY. Tomorrow at 5 Eastern on DIY. Online at DIYnet.com. Welcome back to Talk to DIY. Today we're talking tires and other automotive issues. And the next question would definitely fall into the category of other. 
Visibility is very important when you're driving, and although you don't generally think about your defrost system until a cold day, it should be in tip-top shape all year round. Michael from Snellville, Georgia, needs a little help in that area. What's your question, Michael? Well, hi, I'm working on my 89 Ford Escort GT, and on the hatchback, uh, the rear defroster grids don't seem to be all working. And I've purchased two different kits to do the job, but looking for a little insight as to what kind of preparation I need to do and if there's any extra tips that you can give me. Okay, we can give you some tips. Let's first start off with the problem so that everyone's on the same page as you, Michael. What we'd like to do is ask you to turn on your vehicle, put it on the accessory mode or whatever it takes to turn your rear defroster on. Now, we've actually set this up for you so you can see with a test light. Now, once your rear defroster is on, you want to find out which of those lines aren't working and what areas are not working. So what we've done is we've hooked this up. And if I put a test light on this area, you can see that the light is turning on. That tells me I'm getting power conductivity, which is causing that rear defroster to work. Now, as I move along the line, there's areas where it's not working. And as we go further along, it's then again working. So we've got areas that are working. It's intermittent. Now, another way to do that simply would be to rub your finger along it. You can feel the rough areas where the line is working. And again, when we knew it wasn't working, there's no line there. So it's entirely possible you put something in your, in your trunk that had caused it to rub off or in your vehicle. Did that happen to you, Michael? Well, I think when we were moving last time, I had a, a large box, and it, it must have rubbed during uh, transportation and, and rubbed that stuff right off. Well, that happens. It's very common. So what we're going to do is show you how to repair that and how you can use your repair kits. Now, one of the repair kits you can buy, and there's different types, not knowing what you've got, you can buy one that just repairs the lines, or you can buy ones that repair, that repair the contacts where the electrical current comes in. So that depends on what you need and what's wrong, and you'll have to check that with a test light. You're also going to need some glass cleaner and some alcohol, just in case you don't have that in your kit, and of course some paper towels to make sure it's nice and clean, because that's the key to making sure it's a perfect fix. Now you can also buy kits that have everything in it, but the key to any of these kits is to follow the directions exactly. And some of the kits have different things. One of the things we did notice, and this is a DIY tip, is when you're repairing the lines, the brush that came with this particular product was a little bit thick. And we thought if you're going to repair a thin line, you need to have a thin brush. So we went out and bought a craft brush or an artist brush such as this in order to make a very clean, thin line to match along with the rest of the system. Now, this also comes along with a stencil. And this kit, because it also had the part for repairing the contact, had sandpaper and adhesive and uh, also a cleaning product. So everything was included, which is good, so that we don't have to go back to the parts store. Now, we'll start off by taking this stencil. But before we do that, let's clean that area and show you how to repair it. So you're going to take your glass cleaner and you're going to squirt it on the glass where you know you're going to be repairing this area. And you're going to spray that on and wipe it off really well. You can also use alcohol, but the idea is to use an alcohol-free glass cleaner and then use rubbing alcohol or a prep such as this to clean off the surface. We'll use a different rag, put a little alcohol on that, cap that off. And we're just going to clean that area so when it, it'll dry quickly, you want to make sure when you put that stencil on, it sticks properly because we want to repair this and we want it to be a permanent fix. So we'll get another rag, make sure it's nice and clean. That is the priority in getting this kit to work right. Now we've got that done. Our next step is to get the stencil. And we're, here's a stencil. We'll take off the, the backing for it. And we're going to take the stencil. We're going to put it up on the window where we want to repair the line. So we'll take that and put that up. And this is the area again. We're going to confirm that. We're going to place that right where we need it to be, which is right here. Press down on that stencil really well because this one area, of course, you may use, need to do more than one area, but this specific area, you want to make sure that it doesn't bleed over. You want to make sure it's down really well. Now, the next step is to get this product to repair the lines. So you want to shake it up, like it said to you, in the directions. Open up the bottle. Use that little painter's brush and just want a teeny bit. You don't want too much. Just a teeny little bit. And then we're going to move that over to this area and we're going to paint on the line. And the nice thing is you can repair it. Not being the best painter in the world, I will take my time to do this just so it's back on the line. There we go. We got some of that. We're going to let that dry, follow the procedures, and that will get us our defroster working again. Again, if you've got a problem at the context, you want to use a kit for that also. Thank you for your question, Michael. Hopefully that answers it. Well, you guys have been a real help. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You know, Steve, having a real